Welcome everybody to the second lecture of uh, today, Monday. Um, we have Professor Murray Hitzman with us. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him and thank him very much for giving this presentation. Uh, Murray holds a professorship in the School of Earth Sciences at University College Dublin. He's the director of the Irish Center for Research and Applied Geosciences. He has served in past years as associate director for energy and minerals at the USGS uh, from 2016 to 2017. He was the Charles Fogarty Professor of Economic Geology at Colorado School of Mines from 1996 to 2016. And his, during those years, his primary research focus was on the geology of the Central African Copper Belt, which those of us uh, based in Southern Africa probably know him best for. Uh, Professor Hitzman served in Washington, D.C. as a policy analyst in both White House Office of Science and Technology Policy during the Clinton administration, and he also advised the U.S. Senate uh, for J Senator Joseph Lieberman uh, in 1993-94. He's worked in the petroleum and minerals industries from 1976 to 1993, primarily conducting mineral exploration worldwide. And he was largely responsible for Chevron Corporation's Lachine's zinc lead silver deposit discovery in Ireland in 1990. Murray has a BA degree in geology and anthropology from Dartmouth and a master's degree in geology from the University of Washington and a PhD from Stanford University. He has previously served on the boards of a number of mineral exploration and mining companies and currently serves as technical advisor for the private company Cobalt, focused on utilizing machine learning for cobalt exploration. He has received a number of awards, um, including, uh, which are too numerous to mention actually, but um, he, uh, in 2015, he, did, he was awarded the Des Pretorius Award by the Geological Society of South Africa. So with that, Murray, I'll hand over to you and I'll let more people into the meeting. So thanks very much for speaking to us today. Thank you very much, Craig. Welcome to everybody. I can't see the names. I just see a number. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you about it. Um, uh, this is very weird, all these talks being given to people around the world from sitting in your kitchen. But anyway, what I'd like to talk to you today about is the Irish ore field and sort of give a brief introduction. There'll be two additional talks uh, tomorrow and the next day on more specific aspects, primarily the structural geology, which is really critical uh, here. So let's see, I'm not able to move my cursor. There we go. Okay, so the Irish ore field, um, 15 deposits have been um, delineated with over 1 million metric tons of zinc and lead metal. Uh, of the seven mines that have operated in the country, six have been zinc mines and one was copper. And there's been active exploration for over 50 years. And just sort of on the map to go through it, the earliest mine was the Abbeytown mine, which operated during the 1950s, primarily as a source of lead for the Korean War. The next mine and probably the one that really started the boom was the Tina mine here in the um, east central part of the country. And it was discovered by uh, Irish immigrants who had gone to Canada, became involved in the mineral industry there and came back to Ireland convinced there should be something to find. After Tina, uh, the next two deposits were silver mines, which is a historic mine going way back, but they actually found a larger reserve, which was mined in the 60s and 70s, and Gordrum, which is a copper mine. Then in the 1970s, the giant Navan deposit was found here very far away from all the other deposits in an area that was considered very much unprospective at the time. And then there was a hiatus, a uh, number of prospects were found, but the next economic deposits were Galmoy and Lachine found in the early 90s. So one of the things the uh, Geologic Survey Ireland here uh, uses to sort of uh, advertise the country is there's most, the most zinc discoveries per square kilometer on the planet. I'm not gonna comment on whether that's true or not, but it's a nice little tagline. Uh, a significant advantage though of studying the lead zinc deposits here in Ireland is the Carboniferous ba Basin is, is relatively undeformed and it's not metamorphosed. So this enables us to actually look at uh, things like the stratigraphy, the structure, uh, different textural relationships in the ore, et cetera, and really understand these deposits quite well. So the ore forming processes are visible 
and can be studied in relatively great detail. So what's happening right now? Well, at the moment, there's only one uh, mine operating, and that's Navan, also called Tara, operated by New Belieden. Um, Galmoyan Lachine closed relatively recently. Um, Lachine was mined out. Galmoy actually still has a reserve, and there's people looking at it to re restart that mine. Um, the economic impacts of mining in Ireland are actually pretty significant. The last good data we have is from 2016, but as you can see, it has a fairly, uh, fairly large impact on a small country like Ireland. Uh, even though most of the people in the country don't know that Ireland is a mining country and that it produces a substantial portion of the world's zinc. Right now, there is active both green and brownfield exploration by juniors and majors across the country. There's ongoing exploration and resource evaluations in a number of places there. Uh, Novin is the one you see first, and that's uh, what this headline on the other side is. Uh, the Novin <clears throat> or the Tara Deep deposit was found several years ago based on seismic exploration. Uh, actually, the very first drill hole from the seismic survey went through the deposit, which is pretty good. So uh, unbelievable targeting. And that was at a depth of almost two kilometers. So at this point in Ireland, we are now exploring down to those sorts of depths, certainly to one kilometer routinely, and in some brownfields areas down to two kilometers. Uh, the exploration challenges uh, remain. Uh, basically, Ireland has almost no bedrock sticking out of the ground. The co country is covered with glacial moraine or peat. And so everything is done remotely, if you will. And the depths of the target lithologies, I can show you that we have two particular parts of the stratigraphy that are the best endowed, uh, is getting deeper in, in much of the uh, country. So we need new thinking and new tools. And that's what the research group that I'm directing, uh, ICRAG, the Irish Center <clears throat> for uh, Research and Applied Geology, that's one of our main uh, objectives is to help industry here come up with new tools to make new discoveries so we can have more mines and continued and more employment. So we'll start off with some of the general features of the deposits here. Stratigraphic control. The deposits occur in the stratigraphically lowest non-argillaceous carbonate section. So we were looking for clean carbonates, clean limestones, as low as we can get in the stratigraphy. The deposits are structurally controlled they're along or adjacent to normal faults. Their morphology varies from stratiform to highly irregular. The mineralogy is dominated by sphalerite and galena, and the sphalerite tends to be low iron, so it's uh, metallurgically very uh, good. It's a, it's a premium product on the world market. There are iron sulfides in all the deposits, uh, both pyrite and marcasite, but they vary from being very abundant to being quite rare. Um, so that's variable throughout a deposit. Barite the same way, almost every one of the deposits has barite, but some have a lot of barite and some have very, very minor barite. And almost all the deposits have at least trace amounts of copper and silver bearing sulfides, such as chalcopyrite, tenantite, tetrahedrite. And these are often in zones where we think the fluids are actually entering into the system, the so-called feeder zones. So that's actually a very good vector for these deposits as well. In terms of the paragenetic sequence of what's happening in terms of alteration of mineralization, it is quite similar at all the deposits across the country. There is often, almost always in fact, at least some minor amount of pre-mineralization dolomization. It can be quite extensive or relatively minor. And in a number of the deposits, there is pre-sulfide mineralization by iron oxides, hematite, less commonly magnetite, and that's usually associated with silicification. Um, that can cover relatively large areas or it can be quite, quite uh, small and, and very inconspicuous. The first sulfide depositional phase is almost in, invariably iron sulfides, uh, pyrite and or marcasite. That's followed by precipitation of sphalerite, which is followed by the main mineralization event, which is very complicated, very complex with many multiple stages. And that's uh, zinc, lead, Iron, again, is pyrite, marcasite, silver, copper, et cetera. The main event is usually followed by a minor amount of, of sphalerite veining, usually. And then finally, 
the whole event is usually closed out by precipitation of dolomite and or calcite. In terms of sulfide textures, um, they're very complex. They're dominated by massive fine grain wall rock replacements, and I'll show you these. And the other thing that's very characteristic are, is uh, banded vug fill and replacement. So these fluids actually dissolve the carbonate rocks locally, and those holes, the dissolution cavities, then are filled in with sulfides, which grow either as a sediment filling in the cavity or as botryoidal bands that uh, form on the edge of the cavity and often break and form brushes inside the cavities. The associated alteration, uh, mineralization is generally preceded and sometimes synchronous with dolomization. And there may be uh, silicification and deposition of iron oxides prior to sulfide precipitation. We'll end with the age of the uh, mineralization relative to the host rocks. It's been controversial for many, many years, but I think we're, there's pretty much agreement now. Uh, mineralization basically occurred from very near the time of sediment deposition to about 10 million years after the age of the host rocks. And it primarily is, is dealing with uh, replacement of the, the host rocks. Okay, so let's look at the paleogeography and sort of the stratigraphic control. So paleogeographically, uh, Ireland sat in the tropics. You can see the equator would have been just the north of it. It was a, on a carbonate platform, which was in, inboard from a continental margin. And that continental margin was starting to collapse with another uh, continental mass to the south. And that was the results, resulted in the Persinian or the Veriscan orogeny, uh, which comes after mineralization, but we will, its effects were felt in Ireland and it is important. In terms of the stratigraphic section, this is a cartoon that's going from south to north. In the south, we see in orange there, a big uh, zone of old red sandstone. That's the classic sort of red bed facies, alluvial fan. It's filling up a large depot center in what's called the Munster Basin, which is structurally controlled. This also happens to be the northern edge of the Variscan Front, uh, probably again, structurally controlled there. The, Thrust plates came up to this major normal fault zone and more or less terminated there. And then in the, in the Carboniferous or Mississippian, if you're from North America, we had marine transgression, which started in the south with what's called the lower limestone shale. So a carbon, carbonate rich shale, which transitions northward and gets younger obviously into what's called the Novin group, which is a mixed sequence of shallow water carbonates, some sands, and very minor evaporites. Both these are overlain by transgressive going to the north, getting younger to the north, ballystine limestone, which is an argillaceous uh, carbonate, very highly bioclastic unit, uh, carbonate ramp, if you will. And then overlying that is the Walsortian limestone, commonly called the reef, or the Walsortian reef, even though it is not a true reef. It's a deep water macritic mud mound, very characteristic of the carboniferous uh, in both uh, Europe at this time and North America. And then above that, I don't have it colored because as we'll see, the uh, geology, the carbonate geology becomes very complicated. So we'll look at that. The mineralization sits in the lower, the lower most clean limestone. So in the north, that's the Novin group. And in the south, that's the base of the Walsortian limestone. Notice to the north, there also is mineralization in the Walsortian but up here, these tend not to form deposits, whereas in the south, this is where the bigger deposits in this particular unit uh, occur. Okay, basement. It's important to understand the basement as well. Ireland sits in a very interesting area. It's between two major ancient continents, Laurentia and Avalonia, and it's along what's called the Iapetus suture zone. And it really is a zone because it's composed of a whole series of different pieces of ocean basins, island arcs, and et cetera, which are all jammed together and then in fault contact. And it's that basement, which is important because that's the source of most of the metal. This is what it looks like. Um, it's primarily a quartz rich feldspathic, very wacky, with some uh, minor volcanic rocks, dominantly andesitic to basaltic, and a lot of cherts. Metamorphism is low grade, zeolite to print up to lower green schist. And as I'll show you later, the lead isotope suggests this is in fact uh, probably the primary metal source. In terms of paleogeography, 
In the Upper Devonian, this is the time of the old red sandstone, we basically had alluvial drainage right across Ireland with highs uh, both to the east and the west and the north, and a large amount of alluvial material uh, now forming red beds draining off to the south into the Paleo Munster Basin down here. In the lower Carboniferous, uh, we had a sea level rise, at least relatively, or one could say actually depression of the Irish area, probably because of, of what's happening tectonically to the south. And that causes marine transgression uh, between the two paleo highs, the east and west, coming up right through the middle of Ireland and heading here. And this is sort of uh, uh, the amount of Carboniferous rocks that are exposed now. Much of them have been now eroded further to the north or are covered. Okay, so we'll take a quick look at what some of the rocks look like. Um, this, is, this is a cirque in Southern Ireland. You can see these large sequences here. These are alluvial fan sequences of uh, red beds, uh, conglomerates up to silts, up to sands and silts. It's what they look like in drill core, some of the more silty varieties. So it's, it's terrestrial, some lacustrine to marginal marine at the very top. And then in the Corsayan, the lowermost Carboniferous, we have this marine transgression. So in the south, the marine carbonates are conformable with the underlying old red sandstone. And in the north, the carbonates are actually unconformably overlying the basement in large part. Um, Facies variability is, is related to the paleo geography. So land on both the west and the east. And then of course, on what's happening with um, minor regressions and transgressions during the overall northward transgression. So the host rocks for the, Noven, for the lead zinc deposits are predominantly the Novin group up here in the north. That occurs north of this line of orange here. So Novin group was deposited here. And to the south, the lower limestone shale, which has no deposits um, because it's actually too argillaceous. It formed an aquaclude. Um, and when we look at the ore deposits here, on this map, um, you can see they just form, a, form sort of a shotgun pattern. There's no real rhyme or reason why they are where they are. That will change as we go through time. Okay, the Novin group, which is informal designation, uh, is the lowermost marine transgression in the north part of the country. And it's a mixed sequence. It also has been called the mixed beds. Sandstone, shallow water carbonate rocks, oolites, grainstones, etc and some minor anhydrite uh, dominant evaporitic sediments. And if we look at it petrographically, it has a very complex diagenetic history, typical of these sorts of sediments, um, but did cement up relatively well, relatively early. The Ballystein limestone or argillaceous bioclastic limestone, often known as the ABL here in, in Ireland, uh, lies stratig stratigraphically above and is conformable with the lower limestone shale in the south, and the Novin beds in the north. Uh, as you can see from the image there, it's a whole series of relatively thin to thick bedded uh, limestones. In drill core, you can see there are nice shaley bands and then sort of argillaceous carbonate limestone. All the little white spots are bioclass, huge numbers of crinoidal fossils, but also lots and lots of uh, all sorts of other things, forams, trilobites, uh, spicules, sponge spicules, etc. So very, very uh, bioclass rich material. Above that is the Walsortian limestone. Um, it lies stratigraphically above the Ballystein and is conformable, but there is often a very sharp break, so it represents a real change in paleo environment. It's deeper water from tens of meters to probably the edge of the photic zone at about 200 meters. It's a carbonate mud bank sedimentation. There really isn't anything quite like it being formed today on Earth, um, but very typical of the Carboniferous Mississippian. It consists of macritic mud banks, which are very poorly argillaceous, and which are basically are composed of huge amounts of bryozoa fronds and, and also other bioclasts in there. Um, but it's typically, or one of the typical things about it is this stromatactus cavity, and they're cavities filled with coarse uh, carbonate cements. Uh, usually calcites. Many of them form where bryozoans have flopped over on their side and gas gets trapped underneath, probably from decaying organic matter within the carbonate mass and forms sort of a, a, a hole in the rock. 
Um, Cross-cutting relationships indicate that this limestone lithified incredibly early. So basically, while the mud banks were on the seafloor, uh, within, within a meter, certainly of the top of the mud bank, um, it, it's, it's a, almost a rock. It's really cemented by these marine calcite cements. So, so the porosity and permeability of this rock is very low, very quick, which means it's very odd that it actually is uh, one of the main host rocks for mineralization in Ireland. Okay, as we jump up now to slightly younger time, the Chadian, all of a sudden the map of the facies becomes very different. And, and I call this a facies mosaic. So it has shallow water rocks, the pale green, which are platform carbonates. It has the yellows, which are oolite banks, which are very, very shallow. And those can be immediately next to these rocks in dark olive, which are carbonate turbidite. So that's basinal or down here in the Shannon trough, cherty limestone and shale, somewhat like the ABL ramp limestones. But again, two sort of basins connected by a series of fingers coming through here, um, connecting these two basins together. And then to the south, we have Walsortian still being deposited in some places, and then a real basin down here to the south, the South Munster Basin, where very little sediment gets into. And so we have a very condensed section of a black shale, in fact. Also notice we have volcanic centers, a large one down here in the south in the Limerick area, and another one here in the middle of the Dublin Basin in a place called Crockett Hill. And we have others out here, now known in the Irish Sea, in the Isle of Man, and continuing up into England. Now if we look at the ore deposits, the red dots, you can see they start to line up on things that may make sense. They're sort of on the edge of the basins, right? So, so maybe now we can see some sort of control. And to look at the rocks here in these, this part of time, uh, here are the carbonate turbidites. You can see their beautiful graded beds here. We can see that even better in drill core. And you can see they're quite dark. They're, they're relatively carbon rich, carbonaceous. Uh, they often contain quite a bit of pyrite and in some, several places contain huge amounts of pyrite, especially next to the Novin deposit. But they're, they're not, particularly odd, they're, they're uh, typical carbonate turbidites that we see in many places around the world. Right next to them, we can find things like this. It's hard to see, but that's an oolite, um, so an oolitic limestone. And we know that's exactly the same age as the photo just before, and they're only a couple of kilometers apart, and that we've done through micropaleontology, looking at the critters in it. So yes, we have oolite, shallow water rocks being deposited immediately adjacent to deep water rocks. And, and this is drill core, this is the uh, stromatactus cavities in the wall sortion. And then you see this dark infill here. And that dark infill, as it turns out, is a little bit of uh, uh, silt, which is causing it to be dark, but much of it is in fact oolites. So this is actually a karst cavity filled with oolites from a bank that must have transgressed above it. What this tells us is between the uh, deposition of this rock, this mud bank at several hundred meters uh, below wave base, this area was uplifted, karstified, forming caves, and then actually sank, and the oolites percolated down into the cave system. So clearly during the Chadian, we had tectonic activity, which is what the facies map shows us as well. And that that tectonic activity continues into the next stage of the lower Carboniferous, the Arundian. And what we can see here is the ba two basins are still there. Carbonate turbidites now are uh, forming in the Shannon trough. And we still see these lines of small basins trying to sort of go between the two. And again, the ore deposits are sitting more or less on the basin's edge. Okay, structural history. You're gonna hear a lot more about this tomorrow and on Wednesday, so I'm not gonna belabor it, but just at least sort of an overview. Um, extension, extensional normal faulting began in the mid Corsayan during the deposition of the ABL or the Ballystein limestone. And it formed <clears throat> or started with the formation of segmented normal fault arrays. And they were concentrated sort of along, well, within the zone of of the Iapetus suture zone, which is sort of that, that middle part of the country, uh, along what were obviously large basement faults. There are subtle thickness changes in the ABL at first, 
And then we see clear differences developing in thicknesses during the time of the Walsortian limestone. And also during that time, some of these faults die, stop movement, and movement gets transferred onto a series of significant faults, um, which then sort of take over most of, the, uh, most of the movement from them. And it's these sort of fault arrays, this is Lachine here with a series of normal faults, which control the ore bodies, you can see here in the dark. And this is just a contour map of the top of the ABL or the bottom of the wall sortion. And what we can see is in fact, the ore deposits are sitting here in, in paleo holes next to these, these faults. So when I left Ireland after having found this thing and drilled it out and, and uh, walked, gone back out of Ireland, um, we didn't have this. One of the neat things coming back into Ireland and working with iCrag is, is since the Tara discovery with Seismic, uh, the companies here have been shooting lots of Seismic. And so we have access to many, many, many data sets. And we're actually, for the first time, really starting to understand uh, the 3D architecture of the Irish Midlands. And it's uh, not surprisingly much more complicated than we thought. And uh, as I say, you'll hear about that in the next two talks. Okay, so overall what we have in a cartoon sense is basically extension um, in these two basins, the Dublin Basin and the Limerick Basin, sort of north-south. And the fact that we have these other sub-basins trying to join those two up suggests that in fact, the extension is really trans-tension and there's a bit of oblique slip going on. When we look at all these faults together, uh, the overall amount of extension across the Irish Midlands is pretty small. It's less than 10%. Okay, so it's certainly an extensional event and there are vol volcanics associated with it in the Limerick Basin and in the Dublin Basin, but it's, it's still a relatively small extensional event. Okay, and then we have one other thing that does happen and that's during the very latest Carboniferous, we have Variscan or Hercinian compression. We see this throughout the Irish Midlands. This is in fact the coast, on the coast north of Dublin, so quite, quite far north in the country. Uh, very far north of the what's called the Variscan front. And, and this, this deformation, this folding and reverse faulting postdates the mineralization. So what is really necessary to form any ore deposit, Irish or not? And we sort of need the same sorts of things. We need the elements of interest, the source, if you will. We need a transport, way to transport, and we do that with fluids and through pathways. We need a means to concentrate the elements or a trap. And importantly, we need some sort of energy to drive the system, to make the fluids move. And these are all at least in part chemical processes. And that's why, you know, as economic geologists, one of the things we do is we're geochemists. Okay, so source. So in this case, we need a source of both metals and sulfur because we're forming sulfide minerals. Work over the last 35 years in Ireland uh, indicates the metals in the Irish ore bodies were ultimately sourced from the lower Paleozoic. So in my old papers, uh, when I was here back in the 90s writing about this place, uh, I actually hypothesized that the metals came from the old red sandstone. And some probably do. But I think there's no doubt that the work um, has now shown that the, the vast majority of the metal must come from more or less right below the deposit. <clears throat> And the lead data is really what shows this best. Um, this is personal communication from Steve Hollis, one of our researchers here at ICRAG. He's done a lot more uh, lead isotopic work. And what he's shown is that it really does uh, reflect the basement underneath. The lead isotopic compositions are, are controlled by, by what's, what's in the basement. And this has been seen before. Um, we just know it better and better now. The, the isotopic compositions vary from Northwest Ireland to Southeast Ireland in a very, very systematic way. And if we look at what's happening in the lower Paleozoic rocks, they also vary as well. And they vary systematically. Okay, source of sulfur. Well, it looks like in these deposits, we have two sources of sulfur. The main one is lower Carboniferous seawater here at about plus 20 per mil. And, and we see that in some of the lower Paleozoic veins in barite. We certainly see it in the barite in the uh, ore deposits themselves. And then the other place we see it actually 
This is very uh, negative sulfur, isotopic sulfur here. This is bacteriogenic. So this is where seawater has actually undergone bacteriogenic sulfate <clears throat> reduction. And we get very, very negative values in some, some cases, indicating extreme amounts of bacteriogenic activity. What's interesting is we also have this band in here of, of red. Um, this is what we call the hydrothermal sulfur. And it's the same sort of value as what we get in, in the sulfides in the veins in the basement. And this is coming out at roughly sort of uh, zero to maybe 10 per mil, but really sort of zero to five per mil, okay? And we have lots and lots of sulfur data from many, many workers over a long period of time. And we know this pretty well. And so if we just look at individual deposits, uh, here's a cross-section of the sheen, and this is just spot analyses of, of uh, sulfides that we can do with a dental drill. So from very deep in the system along one of the faults, the feeder faults, we get values up to plus 18, so very heavy. As we come up higher, plus 15, plus 16, and then here, right where there were deposits starting to form, plus five. As we move out into the ore body itself, the values drop dramatically, minus 20. On the lateral fringe, minus 30. And minor sulfide sitting above the ore body, way down to minus 43. So clearly, we have a deep sulfur, and we have bacteriogenically reduced seawater, carboniferous seawater sulfate that's coming in. Now, it becomes more complicated because in the old days, we always used a dental drill and tried to drill out an individual crystal. And we knew that was sort of cheating and it was probably more complicated. But now as we have better tools, we can see just how complicated it is. So this is a series of coliform bands of sphalerite from the Galmoy deposit. Two traverses here going through. And you can see here the range of sulfur isotopic values from plus 10 to minus 20 per mil, just on this, which is, as you can see, in millimeters. So you can see it's going from minus 20 to positive down to about minus 18, and then all the way up to plus 10 and back, back and forth. So what this is telling us is in the ore deposit itself, there is really complicated fluid mixing going on, and the fluid is just changing back and forth. It's reacting with the host rock, with the carbonate. It's going out of equilibrium, dumping out metal, more fluids being titrated in, and this is happening in a very complicated uh, series of underground uh, fracture and dissolution permeability, and it's a mess. And that's exactly what we want because mixing the fluids is happening uh, very, very well. Okay, so that gets us into the transport. So the sulfur isotopic data suggests there were two fluids, a sulfur poor fluid relatively, um, but had base metals, and a sulfide rich fluid, which was bacteriogenic. And as we're gonna see from the fluid inclusions, we can actually um, tell us a little bit more about those fluids. So again, this is just data from the Raft Downey trend from Lachine, Galmoy, and Rapla. And uh, what we see there is we have a, basically a trend from a high temperature <clears throat> ore fluid, which has low salinity, to a lower temperature ore fluid with higher salinity. And it comes in different, unit, different minerals, but that's the overall trend, okay? Now, there's a couple of sort of buts with this. Uh, I should say the number of hydrothermal phases are underrepresented in all these different uh, studies that have been done. We don't have many syn synsulfide dolomite uh, analyses. Uh, the carbonate, the, the fluid inclusions that are in carbonates are actually susceptible to a whole bunch of problems. And there's a large spread of homogenization tempers and salinities from individual samples. So there are some, some issues, but nonetheless, I think the data is relatively convincing of what's happening overall. And this is just data from Wilkinson and Ashton uh, from one deposit, Navin. It's the far north, remember, of the Irish ore field. It's the coolest. The deposits do tend to have warmer and warmer temperatures going south. So there is some sort of regional variation happening. So at Navin, we're up to not quite 200, and we go down to about 90, 85 degrees. And again, as we go down temperature, we go up in salinity, okay? And in terms of salinity, there's some interesting things. Um, the, the looking at the halogen chemistry, uh, the bromine 
et cetera, we can see chlorine. We can see that the fluids are along a sort of modern seawater um, <clears throat> precipitation curve of evaporite. And they actually do reach the point of halite precipitation. And we do have fluids that apparently went beyond that. And that's really interesting because we don't know of any place in Ireland really uh, in the Carboniferous where we went to halite saturation. So this is suggesting that some of the fluids, at least coming from the surface, may have traveled further than we think. They may not be from immediately adjacent, but may somehow be coming from adjacent uh, paleo high. That's something we're still working on. Okay, so the general model is basically two fluids, inflow of metal rich fluid, higher temperature, coming up along a fault system, and inflow of sulfur rich fluid, lower temperature, which is coming into a system it's shown here with all these little spider lines. Somehow we have fracture permeability, allows it to come down. And it's mixing with the higher temperature fluid. And overall, we're getting heating. And that heating, plus probably some of the metals, are driving the, back, the, the increase, the spectacular increase in bacteria uh, microbe uh, growth, which is reducing the sulfur. That biogenic sulfide is coming down. Uh, where we preserve the tops of the ore deposits way above, we see that biogenic sulfide precipitating out in the sediments. We get dolomization. Um, we can also see bits of carbon, if we can see that upper part, uh, precipitation of phosphorus and manganese in some places. As we get down into where the fluids were able to react, uh, we get the ore bodies. And I'll get into that in a bit. At an ICRAG, one of the things we're trying to do is actually come up with vectors that actually point us towards where these ore bodies are using geochemistry and uh, isotopic systems. Okay, transport pathways. The hydrothermal fluids, or seawater, at least some of them, were transmitted somehow into the basement and through the old red before coming to the near surface and mixing with the, the fluids that were undergoing bacterial sulfate reduction. So, you know, we have to get fluids both ways. How we get the seawater down very quickly into the basement is another problem that we haven't quite solved yet, but it's clear it happened. All of the Irish ore deposits are located long or immediately adjacent to normal faults with offsets ranging from sort of 100 meters to several hundreds of meters. Uh, and most of the deposits are located at points of maximum throw along individual faults. Not all, but many. Where well studied, the normal faults appear to form N echelon ramp type patterns uh, indicative of oblique slip along the fault systems. And as you'll see to, tomorrow from Kuhn especially, the, the metal zoning patterns indicate that the structural, con uh, the structural contents for mineralization change through time. And so it's a very dynamic structural regime, which is also what we're seeing, for instance, from the sulfur isotopes, that again, the precipitation mechanisms are very dynamic too. Okay, so in ICRAG, we're currently working with extensive deposit scale structure and regional seismic data to identify both productive structures and favorable um, fairways at, at the regional scale. So the traps are the means to precipitate the sulfides. In Ireland, those traps can be both physical and chemical, and in the best systems, both. So we'll start with Novin, which is by far the best system. This is a uh, almost 150 million ton ore body. It's one of the world's great zinc ore bodies and still growing. Uh, this shows the seismic target here. That's now the Tara Deep deposit. So what you're looking at is an ore body. The top part is actually eroded at daylights. So what we see now is an ore body that's about five kilometers long. Uh, we haven't found the south edge of it yet and is sitting out here as well. And goodness knows how much was to the north but I'd say at least a couple of kilometers probably. So it's, it's a big ore body, all right? And it's sitting essentially, as you'll see in the next thing, uh, on a horse between several very large faults. So here's a cartoon view of that. And you can see uh, major faults here uh, on the Eastern side dropping off into the Dublin Basin. And on the other side, smaller faults, but nonetheless still forming this horse. Here's the original section. And um, the original section actually was uplifted. And along this red line, it was eroded. And it was eroded probably in a submarine position 
and most of this material then went sliding down into the basin. Some of it's still preserved here as brescia deposits on this, this contact, but most of it has disappeared in this hole and we, we don't see it anymore. But what that did was it take, took the Novin beds, which are the, the nice clean uh, carbonate sequence, and it juxtaposed it against carbonate turbidites, which are very shaly, um, and formed a beautiful aquaclude. It also meant that fluids coming up along the structures, which had the metals and were hot, were able to interact quite directly with uh, lower carboniferous seawater, which here dumped out huge amounts of pyrite, as we'll see, which is another source then of reduced sulfide. And so we have a perfect both physical trap, but also a chemical trap, which is why Novin is so good. And we can see these sorts of things playing at very small scales. So here, this is at Novin. This is a bed which was dolomitized pre-mineralization, and it was dolomitized so that it has less porosity and permeability than the limestone. We'll see that that's not always the case, but here it was. And so fluids came up, hydrothermal fluids, and now form a replacement body separating the less permeable dolomite from the more permeable limestone. And that happened at multiple scales at Novin. Um, we also got ore bodies, as I said, below the less permeable UDL, the upper dark limestones. Um, and so we have ore bodies like this, which are clearly related to the fault, but also are, <clears throat> are essentially, again, traps. Okay, and this is, <clears throat> excuse me, just a cartoon which shows the different units here. You can see which units clearly were more favorable. They have the red, the ore bodies. Here is that boulder conglomerate unconformity, as they call it, with a big pile of shales above it. And essentially the fluids come up, hit that unconformity and are restricted to this area where they mix them with the seawater sulfate that's being reduced and form the ore. Okay, what about in the wall sorption? Well, a bit different. So if we go to Tina, which was the first of these deposits found or studied, um, the, the wall sortion there is actually quite thin. Uh, this is feet here, you can see that's 30 meters. So it's a very thin package of wall sortion limestone. And, and the ore bodies actually form irregular uh, sort of replacement bodies right up against the, and along the fault, okay? So they're not very big. At silver mines, we also have wall sortion limestone. But something different is here, and that's this, this purple rock, which is a dolomite. And it's a replacive, there's, there's discussion about it, but most of it is replacive. We call it black matrix brescia. It happened before most of the ore or most of the sulfides were precipitated. And it actually provided a permeable zone through which the fluids could migrate and then mix with sulfur that's coming down from the, <clears throat> from the uh, carboniferous ocean. Lachim was even better in the sense that the entire wall sortion became dolomitized prior to mineralization. And then a secondary dolomization event formed again, black matrix brescia. And the mineralization went primarily through that material because it obviously had a higher permeability. And so again, we get a stratiform ore body sitting at the bottom of the wall sortion, extending out through that alteration phase. And to look at that, we we'll just look at what the black matrix brescia looks like. Uh, here it is. And you can see it is a brescia, obviously. Here it sort of looks like a whole bunch of veins that just interconnect, and that's probably exactly what it is. Um, in other places, clearly this, this alteration event dissolved the rock, and we have collapse, and we have a different kind of brescia. So the black matrix brescia has all sorts of different uh, uh, ways of looking at it. Some is a network of veins in situ replacement. Some is actually physical collapse, which looks karstic. And then it gets affected by the mineralization. So here is BMB or black matrix pressure with a little bit of pyrite in the matrix. And here it is with pyrite and sphalerite in the matrix. And here it is where the matrix now has been replaced uh, <clears throat> entirely by pyrite. And here it is where the entire rock now has been replaced. There's still some pyrite left, but all the, this colored material is actually sphalerite. So this rock is massive sulfide. There's almost no carbonate left in that rock. And 
at ICRAG, we're actually, again, utilizing detailed geologic studies combined with state-of-the-art analytical instrumentation to validate several potential vectors to the physical and chemical traps. The things we're looking at currently are trace elements and pyrite primarily. We're looking at other sulfides as well. The isotopic composition of, hydro, of hydrothermal silica, which is uh, relatively, well, it's in all the deposits, but it's not a major phase. So it's hard to separate often, but it's there. Uh, and we're trying to visualize trace element abundance in different alteration minerals is what you see on these images here, black matrix pressure. So the energy, what drives the ore system? So we don't have much extension during the Carboniferous and there's a relatively thin amount of sedimentary succession above it. So how are we actually driving the system? And, you know, in the old days, I proposed it was coming from the Vriskin uplift to the south as the mountain front sort of propagated towards Ireland and it was driving fluids north, sort of an MBT model like we, we hypothesize in North America along the western side of North America for the Selwyn Basin and uh, in the Appalachian collision for most of the classic MBTs in the United States. And, and there may be still some hint of that happening but because we know most of the, the, the uh, metals are coming from right, relatively right below the deposits, that's probably not the main driver. So what is happening? Well, is there direct heating? Um, we've known about enhanced heat flow in the Irish Midlands for some time. Um, we studied the condon alteration indices back when I was in the country in the 90s with Chevron and vitronite reflectance. And it's obvious that the uh, central Midlands have undergone a, an anomalously high heating zone or anomalously high amount of heating. Now, when that actually happened, it's hard to tell. We know it happened before the Variscan, but that's about all we know. We have some other evidence. Uh, the helium isotopes that we have, very little data, but from the Irish Midlands also suggest elevated heat. Uh, the osmium isotopes uh, are compatible with derivation of osmium from a magma, uh, which could be the Carboniferous magma. And in some of the, the volcanic uh, centers, we have lower crustal xenoliths carried up by these, these lavas and diatremes. And dating of these uh, garnets and these things show that they're being heated up to relatively high uh, temperatures at about the right time. So, you know, maybe we have mantle underplating and this may be driven by essentially some sort of plume-like occurrence happening under the Irish Midlands uh, at the same time as the, the limited amount of extension. And so that's why right now ICRAG is really one of our focus areas in the Limerick Basin. And we have several postdocs looking at this, looking at both the general geology, but also trying to understand what's happening with the igneous rocks in this province. Uh, here and we eventually will be working further north in the Dublin Basin as well. So, you know, I'm not thinking magma was the source of the metals, but maybe very, very deep magma chambers that actually fed these sorts of volcanic, relatively small volcanic centers, heated up the crust enough that we actually were able to drive significant uh, crustal fluids out. Okay, age of mineralization. This is sort of how I want to end it up. Um, it's been a contentious for, for many, many years. I think that's dying down. I think there actually is wide agreement now. Um, th there is evidence for near seafloor origin. There's no question. We see that in the, some of the alteration carbonates that have strontium isotopes uh, indicative of carboniferous seawater. And certainly the barite that's precipitated also indicates that it's carboniferous seawater that's giving us that sulfate. We also have bacteriogenically, bacteriogenically reduced seawater sulfate in the deposits and spades. And we see that in all the different sulfides, particularly in the iron sulfides. Um, in terms of near surface mineralization, boy, you can see it at Navin. This is essentially massive pyrite, massive sulfide sitting as beds. And they're, if not syngenetic, they're certainly or super early diagenetic. And we see that there's actually class of pyrite in, in conglomerates within sequences such as this. So, so there is, for all intents and purposes, syngenetic sulfides. So far, not much phthalerite, 
almost all pyrite, looks like the sphalerite's getting trapped below where it's actually replacing the wall rock. And, and things like this. So this is again from Navin, and this is a uh, dark micrite, which is being cut by a vein. And it's come up and it's actually produced, I believe, this hole, dissolved this hole out in a particular bed, and then the vein keeps trucking on. If we look at that in detail, I can see that vein here, and then on the edge of it, this white, sort of a semi-reflected light image, that's actually pyrite, which is lining the edge of the vein, and then blows out sort of when it gets into this, this vug or this open hole. This material up here is sphalerite, as is all the white stuff through here, and some of this could be actually syngenetic sphalerite, but syngenetic inside a karst cavity or dissolution cavity down in the sediment pile. So it's bedded sulfides, but it's not bedded on the seafloor surface, right? So that's where these things, the textures become very complicated. And just seeing small bits uh, isn't good enough. You actually need to log the core, but you also need to get down and dirty in the mines and map out whole stopes to be able to see what's going on. Um, on the microscope, we can see some obvious textures. This is Novin, and these are oolites replaced by sphalerite, and a foram replaced by sphalerite. We can see the same sorts of things at Lachine and reflected light. Here we have a foram, which is being replaced by um, <clears throat> pyrite and sphalerite and galena. And we can see different textures. This is the wall sorption from Lachine with the stromatactic cavities, a little vein cutting up through here. You can see that the sulfides are going out and replacing individual cement layers in these cavities. Pretty amazing. And you can see it here at a slightly larger scale. That sort of cavity rim there has been replaced. And then it can go where it actually almost goes to massive sulfide. And again, I can still see the original stromataxis textures, but the, the rock has been largely replaced uh, by sulfide at this point. We can see it in the regionally dolomitized wall sortion as well. This is largely dolomite with just a little bit of interstitial sphalerite. Here the sphalerite is eating its way into the dolomite. Here it's actually eaten a lot of it. And here it's completely replaced the rock. So, you know, that's what a lot of the ore body is, is, is where it replaces the rock. So there's general agreement, the bulk of the ore stage sulfides in the ore field formed by replacement. But the depth at which that replacement took place is, is often in doubt. Uh, it looks like it's probably from quite near surface at Navin to hundreds of meters, possibly a kilometer, kilometer and a half. The abundance of the bacteriogenic sulfur suggests it's not too deep though, because clearly fluid from the surface is able to get down to these depths quite easily. Geochronology, we have sort of a couple of dates that make sense to us. Veritabidium strontium isochron on sphalerite from the silver mines deposit at 360 and arenium osmium on pyrite from Lachine of about 340. And those probably are basically bracketing the time of mineralization. There are some older things which uh, hypothesize different ages. There was a famous paleomagnetic study done here in Ireland back in uh, 2007, and it gave a date of uh, 270 million years. And I'm sure that's a real date of some sort of paleomag event, but it's not the mineralization. So if we step back and look at the broader picture. So Ireland is sitting over here on the edge of Europe, and there's the Irish ore field with the sort of northern uh, area around Navan and the southern area around Galmoy and silver mines. Limerick Basin would be south of that again. In green, I've shown sort of the deep water, if you want to call it carbonate turbinite rocks in the Chadian, and they extend up and they go through England. So those same sorts of facies actually are, are up here. Right? And we see them elsewhere in the subsurface in Europe. Um, while we have a bit of mineralization in England, some certainly sitting down here on the south coast in Wales, um, and certainly a major district of somewhat Irish variety from what we can tell out here in Belgium, which is, hasn't been mined for many, many, many years. Um, there's been a lot of exploration over the years up here in England, and no one's found anything of note. So again, there probably is something important with a connection to the ocean to the south, right? I mean, all this stuff is somehow related to that. So there's a component that's important there. Notice that we have a paleo high that blocked off any fluid 
from getting up here uh, at the time of deposition and mineralization. And this, this continental margin is actually scissoring closed during this time from out here in the east, which is, uh, whoops, you know, in Germany and stuff where it closed earlier and zippering closed this direction. So by the time we get out here, it's sort of getting into late Carboniferous before it actually really starts getting closed up. Okay, so that's, that's really what I had. Um, happy to answer any questions. All right, I should be unmuted. Thank you very much for that. Um, very interesting and comprehensive talk. I'm sure there's questions and comments and queries. Uh, you can raise your hand and uh, turn on your mic and fire away. I don't. Yes, there's somebody with his hand up. Yeah, hi, it's it's Roger Key. Can you hear me, Craig? Roger, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, no, you know, it was a fantastic talk. So thank you very much. It was so comprehensive. But when you look at the seismic data, what do you look for for you when you're trying to find the you know the, the drill sites? Is it the structure, or do you actually see the ore bodies, then, Mary? So far, no, we we haven't been able to see the ore bodies. So what we're looking for is a combination of structure and the right stratigraphy, where we know the right units are. So we wanna find the two together, and we're obviously looking for analogs of the deposits we already know. So we're looking for situations like Novin, where we have broad anaclinal uh, areas, fault controlled, or nice um, hanging wall situations, more like Lachine and silver mines. So we're, for, we're looking for analogous structure and stratigraphy. Thank you. <clears throat> Murray, a question for me: um, If w what kind of analogs might be existing uh, elsewhere on the planet and elsewhere in time? Any thoughts about that? For Irish type? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's several districts that have exactly Irish type deposits. So, not surprisingly, Nova Scotia, which is where I, you know, would be relatively next to Ireland uh, in the paleogeography if we close the Atlantic had a number of mines, um, which are very Irish. Um, the other place I've seen them is in the Neoproterozoic in the Bambui Basin in uh, Brazil. Um, there's, a, there's several uh, deposits, one of which is producing, which is exactly like uh, the silver mines deposit actually in Ireland. Um, one of the deposits in the Red Dog District is, is almost a dead ringer for an Irish deposit. It's a carbonate replacement deposit. It's a new one that's um, outside of Red Dog itself, I think it's Anorak. Um, so yeah, there, there's a number of deposits around the world. They're, they're really just carbonate replacements forming relatively early um, as opposed to MVTs, which form relatively late relative to host, host rock deposition. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Edmund, I noticed you had your hand up. Do you have a question? Well, uh, okay, I'm on mute. Uh, oh, yeah, am I on mute now? Yeah. Uh, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, Murray passed, partly asked, answered my question. Yeah, thanks. Very interesting, Murray, to uh, get a catch up with having started in exploration in Ireland a long while ago, catch up with the latest picture. But I was going to ask about the extension the other way, of because you showed your final map with Belgium on, but you've kind of already mentioned that in terms of Nova Scotia. But uh, do you think you know, there are any implications from what's been found for additional research, um, additional exploration in Nova Scotia for similar deposits. Yeah, I do. Um, uh, for whatever reason, so far, what's been found in Nova Scotia isn't as, as good as what's been found in Ireland. But, but the, the setting is somewhat similar. And I guess I'd explore it um, again. The, 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 you know, the Canadians have done a great job overall. What they haven't done is seismic what we're doing now in Ireland. And I would think that would be the obvious next step if it was me, would be to shoot seismic in the, the sub-basins we know about in Nova Scotia. And, and I think that probably could be very effective. Thanks. 
Anybody else with comments or queries? Well, I think we, if, if there's nothing more to be said, uh, no more queries or comments, I'd like to thank you very much, Marie, for this very interesting presentation. Thank um, you. Speaking for myself, this is the first time I've seen a really good overview of the Irish deposits, and I think it's been very illuminating. Um, Great. And also the geology on a local level is going to be very complex. So that's the lesson I've taken away from it. But thank you very much for giving us this presentation. For all the delegates and attendees, uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, and there's going to be a couple more of these talks tomorrow and the next day as well on the Irish uh, details of the Irish deposits. So thank you very much. With that, I'll end the meeting now. So have a good evening and uh, see you back here tomorrow. Thank you. Very much, Mario. Thank you. Thanks,